Hello everyone, welcome back to your MPC 005 Unit 1 Basic Concepts and Research. So as you may remember, in the last session, we were discussing the objectives, criteria, and qualities of good research. But today we will get a little bit more into the basics of research, especially when they come in contact with psychology and what is the importance of research in psychology. So let's explore these criteria together ahead. All right, so as you can look at your objectives, our objectives for this session is to first learn the consideration of research or research or considerations that we as researchers have to take within psychologically specific research. Moreover, we will try to understand the context of discovery and context of justification, along with what considerations we have to give to both of these contexts in terms of research. Next, we'll further try to understand the steps involved in research and importance of research in psychology. So I hope you all are ready for a fun, excited session ahead. And I would say that this session is not going to be relatively difficult and the concepts are relatively easy and simpler to understand. All right, let's move forward. Okay, so when we talk about research process, how do you think research really happens, right? So, but before we examine that what researchers have discovered, what they find, what is the data, try to recall that psychology is this scientific study of behavior and mental functioning of individuals. So this is scientific because it uses the principles and practices of the scientific method. The scientific method is the research method. All right. So now empirical investigation, whatever happens in the field of psychology, utilizes the knowledge of scientific method to observe, measure and experiment what they are trying to explain. Now, even if we never do any scientific research, we have to learn the information on psychological research because it's still going to be useful to us. So when we talk about psychological research, as you can see, there are two concepts that I have mentioned over here, context of discovery and context of justification. So the process of psychological research is divided into two major categories. And this usually occurs in a sequence where the first is where you get an idea, where you get an insight that, oh, this can happen or oh let's say that this concept is maybe connected to this as simple as memory thinking or even uh, your interpersonal relationships process of socialization anything right so the first step is getting an idea or something that we call as context of discovery in terms of your context of discovery we try to understand and give basic consideration to theories hypothesis and different paradigms all right moving ahead next we have the testing of this idea. See, any idea once it has been acquired or once it has come to the surface level is useless if it is not tested. And hence, testing becomes one of the most important and crucial parts in research. Whatever you are ideating, you must test it. All right. And for testing, we have the context of justification. In the context of justification, we try to understand the scientific attitude and values along with objectivity in the research process. All right. So let's learn about the context of discovery a little bit more. OK, so when we talk about the context of discovery, this is one of the initial phases of research during which your observation, belief, information and general knowledge often leads you to come up with a new idea or a different way of thinking about a phenomena. Now, you might notice that there are various definitions of any psychological concept. This could be emotions, motivation, cognition, and each definition differs from the other. Why so? Because there are certain differences that are there in terms of the person who is giving or coining the definition, right? So researchers often begin the assumption with the idea that all events, whatever is happening, either be it a mental behavior or physical event, it will have certain causal factors to it. All right. So researchers try to assume that behavior and mental processes follow a set of patterns of relationship that can be discovered and revealed through research. So understand that when we talk about the theories, we primarily talk about the role of selecting theory in context to 
the variable. This is something that we are discussing at. So when we talk about psychological theories in general, we try to attempt to understand how our brain, mind, behavior and env environment is functioning. All right. More so we try to understand the interconnectedness of all four of these elements. Because see, overall, when we look at something, we might just associate one causal factor to it. So someone is angry and we might say they are angry because they have high biological cortisol okay let's say that they have high uh, cortisol in their body and now what happens ultimately we have only given biological basis to it we have not tried to understand it from an emotional perspective from a social perspective or even from a psychological perspective okay so this is why it's important that psychological theories have given us this foundation where we can study the independent connection as well as the interconnected net of variables so when we have any particular theory which focuses on a more specific aspect of whatever broad conception we have using several interrelated principles to explain or predict some psychological phenomenon. You will also notice that at times what we develop in research is also theory. So when we talk about grounded theory, that particular qualitative research methodology is used to develop more theories. All right. Now, whatever value of theory is, it is often measured in relation to the new ideas or hypothesis that can be derived from it. So what is a hypothesis? First of all, hypothesis is a tentative and testable explanation of the relationship between two or more events or variable. And variable is any factor which changes or varies in size or quantity. We have several types of variable which we will learn in our forward lessons. But if I have to give you an example is let's say that I'm doing a study on anxiousness and smoking. And my research question is that does smoking increase anxiousness? Okay. Now what my hypothesis, what my null hypothesis would be that there is no significant effect of smoking on levels of anxiousness. Now do you see that this is a hypothetical statement that is trying to assess the relationship between smoking and anxiousness that what is the relationship between these two are they interconnected if yes then in what way. Alright, so this is something that is important to understand in relation to hypothesis. Smoking and anxiousness are your variables over here. Okay, now I hope you have understood this. Okay, another variables could be, you know, mood or test performance. So most of the things can be a variable depending on what your initial research question is. Alright, next is selecting a paradigm for your research. So when we talk about paradigm, paradigm is something which is a model of the functions and interrelationships of a process, which could be a way of thinking about the world and how to study it. All right. So something that we have to understand is whenever we try to do research, we would be exposed to complex processes, interconnected processes that we might not understand how they function together. So our understanding of a complex process is aided by using the correct paradigm. All right. So the entire field of knowledge as well as psychology can change directions when we include or introduce new paradigms which challenge the existing ones. Okay, so paradigms are basically ways of thinking or systems of thinking. So whenever there is a shift in a way of thinking, there is evolution in the knowledge that has been existed. So before a new th theory can be applied, similarly, before a new theory, hypothesis or paradigm makes a difference in sign, it has to undergo an ordeal of proof. So when we talk about this ordeal of proof, whatever happens is that researcher has to publish it or make it publish. So whatever findings you have collected, you have to publish them and then reviewers review it. Often there are uh, scientific investigators, they try to assess whether they find the same pattern in their own data or not. So all the ethics or qualities of good research come in this place. Okay, Try to remember that when we talk about particularly proof after publication, people try to replicate the study and see whether they are finding similar findings or not or if their findings are different then in what way. Only this can lead to 
a conclusive finding. Remember that no research is final research. There is always more scope in research regardless of what you are trying to discover, especially in fields like psychology, where the ways of thinking or the paradigms can really shift. Okay, so try to understand that whenever a research has been published or if you yourself are reading a research paper, try to be critical about it. Critical about it, not in the sense that demean the paper, no, but in the sense that try to understand where the author is coming from, what are their point of views, as well as what all elements do you think are important and not so important. This allows you to understand how various things are happening, okay? Moving ahead next, understanding research biases. Now, what are research biases? Research biases is basically, you might have heard about biases in general, but research biases, if I have to explain in very simple effects is that while doing research, it is important that you as a researcher are objective and free from any bias. So most of our ideas and beliefs are linked with certain bias because they are influenced by our opinions or values about it. So similarly, a variety of biases are found to distort people's impression of collected data. So whatever data you have been collected or you have found, it might be judged differently depending on a certain bias. So one is external influences. So this is influences of one's culture or media and these influences can influence people to accept a particular worldview. Let me give you an example of a worldview where uh, a research says that most of the homemakers suffer from loneliness and depression. Okay, let's say this is something which I say and they have high uh, rates of suicidal ideation. However, the data which is actually true Okay, let's say that this was just my study specific to my country and there is already a lot of issues that are happening. Okay, let's take in this view. and But the real data is that men are more prone to suicidal ideation. Now, what happens over here is since that as a culture or as a media, we tend to portray marginalized group as well rather than a patriarchal system which is already in place. Okay, so this would be an external influence that would change the way your data is being perceived. All right, next is personal bias. Personal bias of your own can distort estimating or evaluating the process as a result of personal belief, attributes, or past experiences. This especially happens sometimes in qualitative research if you are not trained properly, that a lot of your perceptions influence how you are judging the person. So this is something that can definitely affect. And more so when you as a viewer, viewer of research are viewing some something, things that you believe in, you will agree to them more rather than things that you don't believe in, things that you are critical about. All right. So even if I give you a research that, yes, there are paranormal activities that happen and this is very real. This is a phenomena that occurs, right? As real as us. But let's say that if you do not believe in paranormal or if you do not believe in conspiracy theories, you will simply say that this is not relevant. This is not something which is true. Maybe the researcher did not pay much attention. So we'll try to find faults at a greater space rather than in cases where we are not biased. Next is observer bias. So when we talk about observer bias, this operates when some events are taken as meaningful by some and not taken meaningful by others. And while we are, you know, assessing this as well as including this, we must understand that we are from different countries cultures and even researchers themselves were raised in certain cultures and society. So they also might have been exposed to certain gender role expectations and these and apart from that their socioeconomic status, their education level, their marital status. So all these elements or their socio-demographic or background can affect the way that researchers observe and interpret events in their lives. Okay, next is expectancy bias. So when we talk about expectancy bias, this can affect observations of behavior by encouraging reactions to the events being observed. So in this case, what happens is sometimes we are expecting to find specific outcomes and hence we may see what they expect to rather than the remaining of the objective. Okay, so 
this particular bias is you know something which you cannot alert a person about and it happens because we are trying to observe what you are studying right so it may often seem as though we are observing the event as it is happening but we are actually just trying to look for our own confirmation for what is going on okay lastly is placebo biases so placebo biases occur when people strongly want to believe that yes this works so let's say what why certain people strongly want to believe something and uh just a small trigger warning let's say that if someone who has cancer okay there is a group of people who have cancer and it's a rapid growing cancer but there is a treatment which have experimentally proven that yes it works right so what would happen is that they would want to believe that treatment works even if there are no scientific proofs to it so many people have often claimed that they feel better after taking a placebo such as a sugar pill now in this case what happens is that you are hoping that you will get better after you take this particular medicine or after you go through this treatment but even if the treatment is not effective even if the treatment is not working you would still believe on it that yes this may work okay and you might even say that okay you know this works for me why well, i don't know why it's not working for you so that is something what placebo bias is so i hope the context of discovery is clear to everyone now moving ahead next in the context of justification now what did we talk about justification justification is the second phase of research where we try to understand the results for useful communication with other scientists all right so psychologists often face a difficult challenge whenever they are trying to get accurate data you yourself if you have had the chance to collect a subject for a practical or to ask your friends to fill a google form it has been hell i remember most of us got really tired and gave up in the end that okay if you want to fill the google form fill the google form or don't right so this is why it makes it really difficult for us as psychologists to get accurate data and reliable evidence which will generate valid conclusions so the authenticity of data in psychological research is really something that researchers worry about because at a lot of time it is extremely challenging to have subjects that many subjects will sit for that long okay so they all rely on one alley to succeed which is the scientific method so in order to make sure that they are able to do valid conclusions they stick to the scientific method in scientific method you have a general set of procedures for gathering and interpreting evidence in ways that would limit errors as well as yield dependable conclusions so what happens is that in your scientific method you can demand special attitudes and values on the part part of research scientist right so the method itself asks you to be have such a scientific attitude that you have to be curious you have to be critical you have to question everything right so this is something that we talk about when we talk about scientific uh, attitude and values associated with the research process so one of the things is that as scientist even psychological scientist you have to be curious about the unknown and uncertain why is this happening and why is this not happening if these two factors are related then why are they related try to look beyond the data try to look into the interpretations of why and how something is going on all right so there are several chances where you might get a false positive or false significant and the truth may be slightly distorted so scientific method in itself you have to have a att attitude that you will demand a critical as well as skeptical attitude towards any conclusion so before you have any conclusion you draw out any conclusion you will not believe it until it has been duplicated repeatedly by independent investigators it is important that if it is a large scale study where they have proved something ground breaking it is necessary that other investigators are also proving similar things because if everyone is proving different things then there is no point right because what happens ultimately is that there is no consistency in research so there is consistency in research why because we have the scientific attitude of skepticism and criticalness 
All right. Another thing is secrecy. So secrecy or being secretive is not appreciated in the research procedure and the research community because whatever data and method you have, they should be open for public verification and domain. See, this means that whenever you have a specific data set or whenever you have something, you have to make sure that you are putting it in such a way that it can be verified by others. Whatever steps and procedures you have written, other researchers should be able to replicate it. Okay. And only this replication can allow conclusions. Otherwise, we cannot. All right. Moving ahead next, we have the objectivity safeguards in research process. As I said, that this is the scientific medium of going about research and hence it's important to understand the scientific method and attitude that we have to maintain. So objectivity safeguards include your procedural safeguards, your standardization process, operationalization and avoiding of bias. Okay, so let's discuss each one of this in detail. So when we talk about procedural safeguards, these are used to increase objectivity. So because we want to minimize subjectivity in the process of data collection and analysis, we try to use procedural safeguards. Okay, these safeguards often start with keeping a complete record of observations and data analysis in such a way that other researchers can understand and evaluate. So it's basically like keeping a tab of everything that is happening but in such an organized manner that if I as an external scientist would want to look at it I can look at it okay another is the second safeguard which is standardization so standardization means uniformity generalization this means that consistent procedures in all phases of data collection would be utilized so all subjects should receive the same instructions and be treated the same way just because we don't like someone or they were rude to us before we cannot treat them differently if they are a part of our study okay so you have to apply a standard treatment for all participants in the course of study you also have to ensure that everyone would have the same basic or bottom line experience okay next is operationalization so when we talk about operationalization it means that standardizing the meaning of concepts specific to your research something that we spoke about earlier the operational definitions. So an operational definition is a concept which defines that concept in terms of how you are measuring it, okay, or what operations produce it, right? So this is the way that you define your measure, all right? So you have to make sure that you maintain objectivity by avoiding any and all bias. As we spoke about, there are going to be external biases, influences, personal beliefs, observer bias and placebo biases. So you have to understand there are always going to be certain elements that would come and hinder with your objectivity. But you have to use control procedures to avoid any and all biases and test hypothesis in a way which is free of any bias. Okay. Remember that if we are biased towards our study, we will not be able to make specific and valuable conclusions. So it is important to understand that whenever we are making a conclusion, it's coming from a space of justification. Okay. That is all which I will be talking about in the context of discovery and justification. I hope that these considerations in the field of psychological research are clear to you all now. Okay, let's move forward to the next concept, which is steps in research process. So there are a total of seven steps in research process and try to understand that research process consists of a series of actions and steps that you need to have to conduct that scientific research. Okay, so if researcher follows certain steps in conducting the research, the work can be carried out smoothly with least difficulty. Okay, so one of the first step is identification of a problem. So what do you want to study? As I said earlier, let's stick to our example of anxiousness and smoking that I want to study how does smoking increases anxiousness. So my first and foremost step is to identify the problem by asking a question or a need that arises as a result of curiosity. Okay. And that you have, you must find the answer to it. That should be there. That attitude should be there. It could also be that, you know, what is the relationship between stress and coffee, or you might want to study the effects of coffee on to study. And once you have understood the problem, once you have identified 
identify the problem, the next step is you try to collect research about it. Okay, and this is something that we call as review of literature. You review the previously existing studies, you understand both. So let's say if my question is, or my ideation of my research is that the influence of smoking on anxiousness. So when I am drawing my study, I will probably have two hypotheses. Okay, one would be my null hypothesis that there is no significant of smoking on anxiousness. And my second hypothesis would be an alternative hypothesis where I may say that there is a significant influence of smoking on anxiousness. Okay, so in step one, uh, when I have identified the problem, I would also collect literature connected to it. So I will try to review a lot of literature, review a lot of studies which are in relation with the same concept, right? So I will try to focus on both the findings that support this idea and the findings that do not support this idea. I will also try to look for what are the common theories related to this concept or if there are any models that have shown a particular relationship between such variables, okay? So this is something that I will be doing in my first step. Now, when we talk about your second step, which is the formulation of hypothesis, as I said that you, have, you will probably have two hypotheses. Okay, and hypotheses are often defined as a tentative statement which will show a relationship between variables that you are trying to study. So it is often stated in a declarative sentence and when you are writing your master's thesis or your dissertation, the way you write it is that there is a significant influence in this particular and particular variable. Okay, so try to understand this element because hypothesis formulation would definitely impact the way you are studying your variables. Okay, so let's say that you have analyzed everything, you have found the data and now you want to validate it, you want to prove it, right? So what you will do is you would need your hypothesis, okay? So any hypothesis, another example could be that those who are rewarded shall require less number of trials to learn the lesson than those who are not rewarded. If I am trying to study something related to learning and trials, okay? So for any unbiased research, it is important to formulate a hypothesis in advance of the data rather than forming a hypothesis after the data. So you have to remember this, that as a researcher, you cannot formulate a hypothesis once you have collected the data you have to always formulate a hypothesis once you are in the process of finding your research finding your problem finding your purpose rational of the study all these elements okay now let's move to the next step which is step three identifying manipulating and controlling variables so when we talk about hypothesis, we will also have our variables in it because your hypothesis would be about your variables, right? As I said, that there is a significant influence of smoking on anxiousness, right? So I have my variable smoking as well as anxiousness, which is my other variable. So variables are often defined as characteristics which are manipulated, controlled and observed by the experimenter. So majorly there are three types of variable that are recognized. So this is your independent variable, dependent variable and extraneous variable. So the dependent variable is one about which the prediction is made on the basis of the experiment. So smoking will have an influence on anxiousness. Anxiousness becomes the dependent variable. In other words, dependent variable is also the one which changes as the independent variable changes more so. This is a variable which the researcher cannot manipulate. Okay, so there are obviously studies and analysis with multiple dependent variables. However, in a basic research design, you have a single dependent variable and dependent variable is not the one which is changed or manipulated. All right, moving ahead next, we have independent variable. So independent variable is the condition or characteristic which is manipulated or selected by the experimenter in order to find out the relationship to some observed phenomena. So if I want to understand the how smoking impacts anxiousness, what I would probably do is I'll try to manipulate the amount of, you know, let's say I take three groups. One group of chain smokers, people who smoke every day one pack one group of uh, people who only smoke once a week and one group of people who only smoke let's say once a month and last group of people who never smoke so you can see that I have a range of my IV 
the level of smoking is different as per each group then i'll try to see the anxiousness of each participant and how it is driven by smoking okay so this is something that we try to do often now in extraneous variable it is the uncontrolled variable which can affect the dependent variable so as we discussed in the beginning that there are obviously going to be more than one factors that may impact a variable and sometimes the variable that you cannot control is an extraneous variable so experimenter is not interested in the changes that are produced because of this extraneous variable and due to this we try to control it as far as it is possible okay so extraneous variable is also known as the relevant variable because in order to make a variable clear precise and easy to communicate it is important that we operationally define it right so as i told you about operational definitions you have to understand that each of these variable your independent dependent and extraneous would be defined in a specific different manner okay so anxiousness may be defined as the for my study i might say it is the level to which a person feels restless okay why am i defining anxiousness like this i am probably defining anxiousness like this because i want to explain the concept in terms of restlessness that maybe smoking does increase restlessness right so i am operationally defining it so formulation of operational definitions in a study is really important okay moving ahead next to formulating a research design so when we talk about a research design this is often regarded as the blueprint of your procedure which you will be using in your research for testing the relationship between your variables okay now there are several kinds of research designs so we have experimental design and the selection of uh, any of these research design what you will do is you will try to see what are the needs of your study so let's say if i want to study the effect of smoking and coffee on anxiousness okay i want to study these two elements on and their effect on anxiousness so you can see i have two ivs over here two independent uh, variable and one dependent variable okay so what kind of research design i might use over here and why i will use it okay now let's say that in this i have problematic smokers and non smokers similarly in uh, coffee i have coffee addicts caffeine addicts or non coffee drinkers okay people who have never touched coffee so now i will be using a 2 by 2 factorial research design over here we will be studying all these elements this might sound a little technical but we will try to use a 2 by 2 factorial design because both my ivs have two levels to it there are two factors to it okay so hence whatever research design you are using it will be the blueprint of your study next is data analysis and their interpretation so whatever analysis you will make whatever you know uh interpretation that you make is often dependent on the way you are trying to study it right so when we talk about our data analysis and interpretation let's say in our research design we chose a specific medium of data collection mm -hmm. i decided to use a form of data collection which is only specific to a certain population that i just wanted to do purposive sampling right so and the tool with which i was using the data or i was collecting the data maybe i was just relying on an experiment or maybe i was just relying on self measures so whatever analysis is drawn is based on the kind of data you have okay if you have categorical data you might use anova however if you have numerical data about certain groups you might even use regression depending on the basis of your study okay so depending upon your nature and purpose of the experiment you either use a parametric statistics or a non parametric statistics and in this case you choose the statistical analysis accordingly so the purpose of carrying out a statistical statistical analysis is to either reject the null hypothesis or accept it or in case you know sometimes we reject the null hypothesis to accept the alternative hypothesis okay 
Next step is drawing conclusions. So when we talk about conclusions, no study is complete without conclusion. So as an investigator, after analyzing the results, you try to draw out some conclusions in your study. So you try to understand what were certain statements that were said. If your findings came out to be true, why did it came out to be true? How is the research supporting it? How is theory supporting it? You try to understand what is the connection between all this element. Okay. And lastly, we have preparation of report and publication. As we said, that one of the important elements of a research is also publishing it because it puts it out there for others to see. So in psychology, for we follow the American Psychological Association. Some universities in India adopt six, but currently we are in APA 7 formatting. So a lot of publication and journals are looking for APA 7. If you ever write a paper and are interested in publication, make sure that you do see what what are the publication requirements as well as what are the things that you have to focus on. More so some organizations like in India, we have UGC care list, which specifies what all journals are acceptable and supported by UGC. Okay, so this is all about your steps in research and process. So last step is basically writing everything up, finalizing the drafts and then just sending it out and waiting for it to get published. All right, moving ahead next to our last concept of today is trying to understand the importance of research in psychology. Now, I want you to look at it through an end where think about it, the psychology that you have probably studied for the past last three years, four years, depending on whenever you started this. And anytime you read a theory, there is an experiment connected to it. If we look at Bandura social learning theory, the Bobo doll experiment, if I look at operational conditioning, there was another experiment, right? We had the little Albert experiment. If we look at Pavlo, there was the conditioning experiment that was there on dogs. So every study has a experiment and the fact that we have these theories about learning, about behavior, about cognition is primarily because of research. So whatever progress we have reported in the field of behavior and you know how we understand human beings and psychology of a person is through research findings. And by the application of this psychological research findings, we are able to uh, move forward as a society in terms of education, medical sciences, as well as human behavior. Okay, next is that we often have practical gains of psychological research. This means that we are able to discover methods of treatment for pe treating people. A lot of, uh, you know, CBT, REBT, all these techniques, they were out of research. So they were developed out of research. Okay, lastly, in psychological research, there is there are rigorous scientific norms and statistical methods which are applied in a study. And when they are applied, you are able to make Make better generalizations and conclusions that help you come to and realize that yes this is something which is true and this would not be possible in terms of research if we wouldn't have it in psychology so try to understand it from your personal uh, perspective that you know whenever somebody says as a psychology student whenever someone says you something try to Connect it with, have you read about it somewhere? Even when you come across a social media post that says that, you know, these are the five top signs of lonely people. Try to understand that, have they cited any study? Are there any such studies? Or are these just basic human behavior? They have been pathologized. Okay, so this is why research is important. It creates awareness in the field of psychology as well as it maintains the progress and growth. Okay, so with this, we come to an end of our today's session and I hope you all had a fun session and you were able to learn lots. We discussed various elements in our today's session. We learned about how the context of justification and context of discovery works. Then we learned about different biases as well. Along with that, we discussed the methods in research and we also discussed in specification to what are the steps in research. So there we try to understand the analysis medium, the research designs that are there, right? And lastly, we discuss the importance of research in the field of psychology. 
So with this, I have a let's discuss round for you. So my first question is, what is research and discuss qualities of good research? This is a concept that we did in our previous session. So I hope you remember what is research rediscovering, right? So define that process. Also give definitions by, I think it was Grimwell as well as Kerlinger and Burns. And then you have criterias of good research. You can write them in bullet points, but do elaborate upon them, okay? Then in your opinion, what may be various criteria of good research similarly for both quality and criteria you have to write the pointers but you also have to elaborate them so your answer should always have an introduction conclusion and a theme so first you introduce your topic you talk about research in psychology what research is then you talk about the scientific method what is the scientific method how it's connected to psychological research then you talk about the criteria of good research okay next is discuss importance and relevance of psychological research Research, mention pointers that in this this field it is important it is helping how it is helping all these elements are something that you can point towards all right now why formulation of hypothesis is necessary while conducting research because if you do not have a hypothesis you will have nothing to support your findings for it would become non-scientific and hence it is important to create a hypothesis before you go about the study because your hypothesis also determines what you are trying to study okay how the steps in research process do help a person to get knowledge now when we talk about steps in the research process and if you look at seven of these steps each of the step has its own value, right? We can understand that first it becomes curiosity to basic finding and generalization and hence it creates a better knowledge space. So write it within this concept, like how it starts from a question and it ends to an answer. Okay, with this, we have ended our today's session and our unit one. I hope you all had lots of learning. Do read your learning materials and try picking up any research paper that you find interesting. Remember that research is not as intimidating as it may seem. And it is something that would spark a sense of curiosity in you and help you evaluate whatever you are learning with a deeper lens. At times, we just look at things from a surface level, but when we get into research, we are able to do that on a more in-depth as well as at a more deeper level. Okay, that'll be all. Thank you for attending and see you all in the next lesson. Till then, happy learning.